Well, welcome today to the presentation. And when you saw that the title of the presentation was Logic of English, did any of you think that this is an oxymoron? Yes, because you're probably continually telling your students that that is an exception, aren't you? And having to explain away maybe the history of the language or some reason why this word doesn't fit the patterns. Well, what I'm hoping to do today is to break that conception that English is illogical and riddled with exceptions. Before we do that, though, I want to talk about why we all believe that, because I'm on a mission to change how we think about our language. And I believe that the way we think about our language stems from how we were taught. Now, some of us were taught using sight words. This uh, is exemplified in Dick and Jane. Um, some of you were maybe taught to read using Dick and Jane. And the way that those books worked were the teacher would hold up the word C and say, this says C. And then the teacher would hold up the word Dick and says, this says Dick. And the teacher would say, now you read it, C, Dick. Now, if you've ever wondered why those books are so repetitive, where it says C, 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 <laughs> it's because you were trying to learn how to read using words, whole words. And in fact, this method is still very prevalent in our schools today through the Dolch list. This list of words is thought to be needed to be memorized because they can't be explained logically. But I can tell you that I can explain all of them. And you will be able to explain many of them after this presentation. And in fact, this is very, very common in our schools. My school district just recently um, was added to the um, watch list for No Child Left Behind because of their reading scores. And do you know what their solution was? They doubled the number of sight words from the Dolch list per grade. So this is all around us, even today. There's something we need to know, though, as we think about sight words, and that's that human memory has been shown to be limited to about 2,000 sight sound symbols. And so we can memorize many words as pictures, but we have a limit to that. And in fact, many adults who are functionally, illim uh, functionally illiterate know between one and 2,000 sight words. They have been successful at the task presented to them, yet they still cannot read well enough to make meaning out of a newspaper. Another reason that many of us believe that English is illogical is because of whole language. And I want to be very careful here. There are wonderful aspects to whole language. And I think before we throw the baby out with the bathwater, we need to acknowledge those. In fact, whole language said that, you know, maybe the reason that children are not learning to read very well is because of those boring readers that are so repetitive. Maybe if we gave them real children's literature and surrounded them and gave them a love for reading, they would learn to read. You know what? I believe we have to surround kids with good literature. We have to read to them. Children develop vocabulary. We have learned a lot about early childhood and the importance of reading to children. However, there is a myth that stems with whole language. And that myth is that children learn to read naturally by being read to. And that is not true. Only about one third of students will learn to read almost magically. That's not a majority. About two thirds of our population will struggle with reading if they are not taught in some way that makes sense and more logically. All right, my third belief as to why we believe English is log illogical is because of what I call funny phonics. And funny phonics gives you a headache, just like this boy, because you are presented with rules and then after you get the rule, you start counting all the exceptions. And it seems like there's more exceptions than rule followers. And so I'm going to show you a few examples of funny phonics. Um, here is one. When two vowels go walking, the first one does the talking. Have any of you ever taught this? Because I did. It's OK. <laughs> but look what happens. It works in bread. It works in bead. But then you have great, and you're going to have to say, that's an exception. It works in ceiling. Then what about there? Oh, goodness, the A sound isn't even in that two-letter phonogram. And then we have feisty, and on and on and on. So this is an example of what I call funny phonics. It just doesn't work. There are more rule breakers than rule followers. All right, the one spelling rule that most Americans know is this. Use I before E except after C as in neighbor and way. You can't believe how many people, when I say I teach the logic of English, go, yeah, but I know a spelling rule, and it doesn't work. Here's all the exceptions. <laughs> Do we ever wonder why we're frustrated? I mean, does it make sense when you start to see this? So what I'm going to propose to you today is maybe the problem is not the language, but the rules we were taught. And hopefully, I'm going to um, 
change your perspective on English. Now, we need to begin by understanding the task at hand. So how, do you have any guesses for how many words are in the English lexicon? Just take a guess. More than 800,000. More than a million. By some counts, there are two million words in growing. English is the largest language in the history of the world. The next largest language is thought to be German with about 200,000 words. So we have an enormous task. By the way, these numbers are hard to count because do you count a plural as a different word from a singular? And so, you know, it, there's a lot of room in these numbers. But the point being, English is a very, very large language. The average adult knows between 40 and 60,000 words. You would want them to be able to read all those words that they can speak. A well-educated adult knows up to 200,000 words. Now, just think back to that sight word approach. If you were going to learn 60,000 words, it would equal flashcards as tall as a seven-story building. <laughs> Impossible, ridiculous. So how do we teach such a massive subject so that students can master it? And I'm going to propose to you that we need to teach them 74 phonograms and 30 spelling rules that logically explain 98% of English words. Because when they have those tools, they can begin to understand and they can read any word. I'm also going to propose that we teach the thousand most frequently used words, which comprise 65% of all printed material. So there are words like is, have, was, he, she, it, all those little grammatical terms that build a sentence. Those sentences, in whether they're in a young ch child's book or whether in a doctoral dissertation, make up 65% of all that we read and write, those small grammatical terms. In addition, I'm going to propose that we teach Latin roots because Latin roots explain 90% of multi-syllable words. Also, when you begin to learn Latin roots, you can begin to see the meaning of words and not just know how to read them, meaning of unknown words. And I'm going to share a few stories about that a little later as well. So I'll just leave you with this question. Should we memorize 200,000 individual words or learn the 104 tools that explain these words? And you know, that might seem ridiculous, but you don't know how many people approach me and go, isn't it too hard to learn the phonograms and spelling rules? That is the general consensus of the population. And so I like to put it in perspective because it is really, really hard to learn the other way. In fact, I'm going to share a story right now about Jack Blackburn. Uh, he is retired. He is running for mayor in Altoona. He's a brilliant man. Uh, Jack came up to me at a different conference where I was uh, working, and he bought a copy of Uncovering the Logic of English. And the next day, he came up to me, and he had tears in his eyes. And he said to me, he said, I am as tough as nails, and I never cry. But I went to my room, and I began to read your book. And what I discovered was that there's nothing wrong with me. He said, when I was a little boy, I remember my teacher saying that some of those letters made sounds, but it didn't make sense because there were so many exceptions to those sounds. And so I didn't pay attention to those. And my entire life, I struggled with reading and spelling, and I thought there was something wrong with me. Now, keep in mind, this guy's been very successful. He went on to college. He went on to work at 3M. And this was a deep place of shame for him. In addition, he said to me, he said, every year I go and I tutor a fourth grade boy from my school district who is struggling with school or with academics. None of these boys can read. And he said, do you know what I discovered? All of those boys are just like me. They're gearheads. And this didn't make sense to them, and they really need to understand the whys. He also said, he said, there's only one problem with your book, and that is the title. He said it should be titled The Heartbreak of English, A Logical Way Out. <laughs> so there are many oversimplifications that we've been taught, and logical people or people who think very logically really begin to see these, and they struggle with some of these things. So let's begin to look at uh, the language a little more closely. So English is a phonetic or phonemic language, and phonemic means sounds. And we're going to spend a lot of time in this presentation looking at the rules and the sounds that govern English. 
um, how many letters, but if, by the way, if English is a phonemic language, you would think it'd be important to know some things about that. So how many letters are in the English alphabet? This isn't a trick. 26. But how many sounds are in the language? Now, some of you know that's great. Usually when I speak to a, an audience, they're dead silent <laughs> because the average person doesn't know. There are 44 sounds. Clearly, there's something different going on with English than a one-to-one -one correspondence. In addition, English is a morphophonemic language, and maybe this term is familiar to some of you, but morpho means meaning. So the English code represents both sound and meaning, and I'm going to give you a taste of this right now. Look at the word please. What is the E-A saying in please? E. What is it saying in pleasant? Notice it's saying two sounds, but notice as well that please and pleasant are related in meaning. And in order to keep the relationship in meaning, our spelling preserves the, the relationship in um, spelling. Does that make sense? So the E-A phonogram is going to need to say E and E in this case in order to um, preserve the meaning. Here's one more example. We have the word sign. The GN, the two letter N phonogram is saying N, but what is it saying in signature? GN or G N and signal and design. So the language is more complex, and if we spelled it completely phonetically, we would learn lose this relationship in meaning. So we have a complex code. And we have a morphophonemic language, not a simple phonemic language. It's based on 44 or 45 sounds. We have 74 basic phonograms, 48 multi-letter phonograms. 23 of those phonograms make more than one sound. And we have 30 spelling rules. Now, in addition to being on a mission on to, how we ch um, to change how we teach reading in the United States. I'm on a mission to change how we think about our language. Because I think as a culture, when we think that English is illogical and we dismiss it, as a culture, we have a very dismissive attitude about English. We need to begin to see it as a powerful and beautiful language. Because English is complex, we can do many things with it. It's just like basic mathematics. If you know arithmetic, multiplication, division, you know, you can do so much. If you know higher order math, calculus, you know, all, what all those subjects are beyond that. <laughs> I'm not a math person. You can do amazing things. Do you know what I'm saying? Because that's a much more complex code and system. So because English is complex, it is creative and it is flexible. We have more synonyms than any language in the world. Think about the many ways you can say big, big, huge, enormous, giant. They all have subtleties of differences in meaning. Our language is excellent for technical writing. It's a strong tool for distinguishing nuance. And it's multicultural. I think we can't forget that. We can bring in words from other languages. We can bring in words that represent foods and objects and pieces of other cultures. Not all languages can do that. And so I think it's time that we begin to celebrate English as a beautiful, powerful, complex code and begin to teach it systematically in a way that makes sense. All right, let's look a little closer. I began by teaching students phonograms. I do not teach letters. Too often we limit reading instruction to letters, but then the letters don't explain all those sounds. So I teach that uh, the language is based on phonograms. Now phonogram literally means sound picture. So this is a picture of the sound t. This is a picture of the sound sh. This is a picture of the sound i. This is a picture of the sound a. Notice a phonogram can have one, two, three, or four letters. It's not simple, but it is doable once you see it. It's also very important to teach all the sounds for each phonogram. Now, this is the letter that began me on this journey. <laughs> I am not joking. So the reason I'm here, despite all my background um, teaching adults uh, literacy with ESL, um, I was not taught any of this in my graduate school training. And it was actually when I was at home, I decided to homeschool my children when they were young because I really enjoy teaching and I enjoyed being with them. And I wanted to teach my boys to read and I found a phonetic program for them and it taught about what I had learned um, when it came to phonics. And so I taught them that this says s. And so they read sand, sick, list, and hiss. And then my little boys who are little engineers at the age of four read is 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 and his is hiss and on and on and on. And now they didn't just do this once or twice, they did this for a year. 
And <laughs> I began to get frustrated because I thought, you're not learning your sight words. What's wrong? And I couldn't get it. And then I read a book and I discovered that S says two sounds. It says S and Z. Now, I want you to say S and Z with me for a minute because I have a theory and I want to share my theory with you. So what happens when you say S and Z? What's the same with those sounds? S, Z. Notice your mouth is in exactly the same position. Why do they sound different? Put your hand on your throat and say S, Z. One is voiced and one is unvoiced. So this is my theory. My older daughter, who learned to read very easily, when I said to her, honey, that's not is, it's is, it's an exception. She's very um, intuitive. She said, hmm, there's probably no difference between those. That approximation was enough. Does that make sense? And she could go on. But those little engineers, oh, at four years old or five years old, they knew those were different and they were not going to let it go. In fact, they're very good at the scientific method because they kept trying it out and trying it out until they proved me very wrong. <laughs> and I'm very thankful for that. Now here's one more example of this and why it's so important to teach all the sounds. So I learned that this says ch, as in chin, choice, and check. And I still remember the day I was sitting in school with my spelling word, stool. <laughs> and I remember thinking, I remember the desk, the classroom, I remember thinking, English is so stupid. This says stool. That's so dumb. <laughs> but what does it also say? What does CH also say in school, orchid, Christmas? It says k. And what does it say in chef, machine in Chicago? Now, the script spelling bee is going on out here in California, and have you ever noticed that these kids can spell words that you don't even know what it means? <laughs> it's amazing. But did you notice they also get a clue? What's the clue they get from the moderator? They get to ask the origin. When they hear that the word became from Greek and they hear the k sound, they know it's spelled with a ch. When they hear that the word came from French and it includes the sh sound, they know it's spelled with a CH. In fact, those kids are not rotely memorizing everything. They are understanding it. Does that make sense? That's a huge difference, and it's a powerful tool. So I want to take a moment and teach you A through Z and all their sounds. Now, because you're literacy teachers, maybe this will not be new to you, but I want to tell you that when I go to communities of parents and educators, they're usually shocked by many of these sounds. I often use just a set of flashcards like I would with my students. I've put them up on the um, display for you so that you could see them clearly. So I'll say the sounds, and I want you um, then to repeat after me. A, A, A. B. K, S. D. E, E. G, J, I, I, E, Y. Are any of you wondering about the E? Think about words like piano or about the Y. Think about a word like onion. J, K, L, M, N, A, O, U, P, Qua. Notice I always teach Q with the U because Q always needs a U in English and U is not a vowel here. This is a multi-letter phonogram that says qua, er, s, z, t, a, u, u, a, v, wa, x, ya, e, i, e, z. Were there some new sounds for some of you? Oh, yeah. And when you begin to see that these letters make more sounds than you thought, it begins to unfold some of the confusion that maybe we've had. All right. So another oversimplification that we've all been taught is the definition of a vowel. So go ahead. What is a vowel? Well, you can do the. Yeah, it's this interesting cultural phenomenon. You could get the entire like room reciting this, no matter which region of the country you're in. And I always ask people, do you have any idea why you know this? Because I didn't. We all do. We rotely memorized it. Although it's also an oversimplification because there are 23 written vowels in English and 15 vowel sounds. One of the biggest problems with English is the fact that we have so many vowels. 
we have a lot of vowel sounds. Some languages only had five. It would be much simpler if we did. So in, rather than teaching students to memorize A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y, which doesn't really solve anything, instead I like to teach students what is a vowel. Then they can test them out and discover it for themselves. So let's learn this. A vowel can be sustained or sung. Now if you've sung in a choir, you know this. You sing the vowels. It can be made louder and softer. So try to call for help without the vowel. Help. Help. <laughs> you can't do it. <laughs> because you can't make it louder or softer without the vowel. Also, your mouth is open when you say the vowel. So you can sustain it. It can be made louder and softer. Your mouth is open. Now, a consonant, on the other hand, is a sound that's blocked in some way by parts of the mouth. It cannot be sustained or sung, and it cannot be controlled for volume. So now that we understand this, and by the way, a four-year-old gets this, and they love to test out sounds, um, we can test them. We can do a little scientific experiment on the sounds, and we can discover, is this a consonant or a vowel? So let's try this out. We'll sing, ah, ah, ah. So is this a consonant or a vowel? A, hey, hey. Vowel, ah, ah, ah. Vowel. Let's try, test this one out. B. Consonant or vowel? Why is it a consonant? Can't sing it. Why else? What's blocking it? Your lips. B. You can feel your lips. All right, here's the mysterious and sometimes why. <laughs> I had no idea why it was sometimes why. <laughs> but we can test it now and we can learn. How about yeah, 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 yeah. Consonant or vowel sound? Eh, eh, eh. Ah, hi. Vowel. E, e, e. Vowel. By the way, in the word onion, that I is acting as a, saying yeah, it's acting as a consonant. Hmm. Lots of oversimplifications. <laughs> no wonder I was so confused. Now, I'm going to teach you your first spelling rule. English words do not end in I, U, V, or J. Go ahead and say it with me. English words do not end in I, U, V, or J. Let's apply this rule um, as we learn a few multi-letter phonograms. The first one I want to teach you is A. Go ahead. A. This is also A. A. So notice we have a pair here, A and A. Which one may I use at the end of the word? Why can't I use AI? English words do not end in I. There are lots of paired uh, phonograms like this. This is OI. By the way, is OI a vowel or a consonant? OI, 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 OI. Oh, it's a vowel. <laughs> you know, they never asked you in school to underline the vowel in the word boy or boil. Do you know why? Because it didn't fit the A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y. And so it, they just skipped that. But this is the vowel. Both letters together are the vowel in this. This also says oi. And notice, um, which one may we use at the end of the word? Why can't we use oi? Which words do not end in I. All right, this is one of my favorite phonograms, so I'll have to, can I get this here? This says ow, o, oh, oo, uh. Now, I always like to tell people one of the myths of, I think, teaching phonics is that it can't be fun. And I actually teach a workshop called Teaching Reading and Spelling to Kids Who Can't Sit Still, too. And we use Nerf guns. And tell, I can tell you, it's really fun. But one of the ways I help kids remember this phonogram, uh, I probably wouldn't do this with adults, but I like to share it anyways, is I, I'm from Minnesota. So there's lots of mosquitoes in Minnesota. And I do this. I pretend a mosquito landed on me. I go, ow, oh, ooh, ugh. <laughs> And I share that just because I want to break the myth that we can't have humor, we can't have fun with this. We can. This can be extremely fun. Does this make sense? OK, and this is ow o. Oh. Now, what's the same between ow o, oh, oo, uh, and ow o? Oh? They both say ow o. Oh. If I want to spell ow at the end of the word, which one will I use? O w, why will I not o use o u? English words do not end in i, u, v, or j. All right, this is the phonogram er. All right, everyone always asks me, what about I and you? Do you know, remember what I said about 98% of English words? There are a few exceptions, but these two are native English words that are exceptions. And what I always tell students is this, you and I are very special, so we can end in you and I. In uncovering the logic of English, when it shares a rule, um, it lists all the exceptions afterwards, all of them. And oftentimes, you'll see there are thousands of words that follow 
and there'll be just a couple true exceptions, not this idea that there's more exceptions than rule followers. Okay, here's my question for you. What is the most common reason for a long vowel sound in English? Okay, most people say silent final E. Do you know why we answer that? Because it's wrong, by the way. <laughs> Do you know why we answer that? It's the only reason most of us were taught for a long vowel sound in English. So we think it's going to be the most common. Now, it is common, but it is not the most common. I'm going to let you discover the most common reason, and I like to teach students through discovery of, at all ages because I like to teach them to think logically about language. I want them to become good language learners. I want them to think systematically. And so I give them examples, but I support them so they cannot fail. Now this is different how we currently teach because we usually dump students into this entire complex code of English without telling them exactly how it works and supporting them as they discover it. And in this method, you, you'll be able to figure it out because you've set it up so they can't fail. So let's compare bag and bagel, bend and be, tot and total, hum and human. When is the vowel saying its name? At the end of the syllable. The rule is A, E, O, U usually say their names at the end of the syllable. This is the most common reason for a vowel to say its name in English. Let's look at this letter. What are the two sounds this letter makes? K and S. So it says two sounds, k and s, and let's discover when it says each of its sounds. So it says in words like scent, center, cell, and absence. When is it saying s before an e? How about in cider, circus, cinema, and exercise? Before an i? How about in cylinder, cycle, cypress, and bouncy? Before a y? So c always softens to s when followed by an e, i, or y. What does it say before an a, o, or u as in cat, cold, and cut? What does it say before a consonant as in clap, crane, and enact? What does it say at the end of the word as in arc, toxic, and comic? So C always softens to S when followed by an E, I, or Y. Otherwise, C says K. Now, this is a word that people will often show me and go, C English is so crazy. C is saying two sounds in the same word. Is this crazy? No, it's very apparent. Why is it saying S at the beginning of the word? because it's before an I. Why is it saying k in the middle of the word? Because it's before a U. This rule explains more than 6,000 words where C softens to S. It explains more than 10,000 words where C says k. And what I want you to notice is many of these words are multi-syllable words. And many of these words are words um, that are content words. In fact, many students who learn to read very early in their easily in the early grades begin to plateau about fourth grade. And the reason is they don't have a skill. They don't have the ability to sound out larger words. They have to try to memorize those bigger words rotely as well. But this rule is really critical because this rule begins to unfold how to sound out some of those multi-syllable words. In addition, what's very interesting is at um, professional conferences when I'm working vendor halls, I often put this word up on a sign with a question. Do you know why C says two sounds in circus? And this is what inevitably happens. People come up and there's a little flap that has the answer. People inevitably come up and go, no, I have no idea. And then they read the answer and they're surprised. And if they are a French speaker, they go, oh, I didn't know that. That happens in French, too. If they're a, a Spanish speaker, they go, oh, I didn't know that either. That happens in Spanish. <laughs> and if they're an Italian speaker, the same thing. By the way, here's your tip for Italian. C doesn't soften to the s sound in Italian. It softens to the ch sound. That, therefore, you have words like cello and concerto that come from Italian. And so people who learn um, French and Italian and Spanish in, in their own countries, their schools are teaching this. They know this about their own language. But most Americans have no idea. We were left to rotely memorize that. What are the two sounds of this letter? G and J. OK, so let's discover. When does G say J, as in germ, angelic, in general? Before an E. How about in ginger, agile, and giant? How about in apology, biology, and allergy? Before a Y. 
But I have the problem of what about get and anger? What is it saying <laughs> before an E? Yeah, what is it saying in uh, giggle, gift, and gimmick? What is it saying in muggy, foggy, and doggy? Are any of you disappointed? Because I certainly was. But here's the reality. The rules need to reflect the, the language. G may soften to J when followed by an E, I, or Y. Does it always? So can we say always? No, we need to set up students with the correct expectation about what's going to happen. However, what does it always say before an A, O, or U is in gap, goat, and begun? What does it always say before a consonant as in glad, magnet, and grain? What does it always say at the end of the word? G. So the rule is G may soften to J when followed by an E, I, or Y. Otherwise, G says G. All right. Now, I want to solve some of your spelling um, problems. Even, <laughs> even if you're a good speller, oftentimes people struggle with these things. Now, people often wonder, why on earth do we add a K to picnicking? Can you see now why? What would it say? It would say picnicing if we didn't add a K. What would mimic say if we didn't add a K? Mimicing. What would happen here? Panacea. And garlicky, we need to add a K as well to protect that C. Now, many people look at garlicky and they say, that doesn't even look right to me. Any of you feel like that? So I have a question for all of you. How many of you in the room consider yourself strong spellers? I want you to leave your hands up. This is really important. Now, of course, this is a room of literacy volunteers, so the percentage is higher than the general public, but that's okay. What I want to ask you is this. How many of you have to see the word to know if it is correct? Notice, look around, it's everybody. You're all visual learners. If you're not visually gifted at memorizing very minute detail and visual patterns, you are going to struggle with spelling and maybe even reading if you were not taught why. By the way, put your hands back up if you were a good speller. Do you know why it's spelled correctly? Put, leave your hands up if you do. Even in this room, notice that? Most people do not know why. And that's a big problem because if you can imagine, if you're not a visual learner and you don't know why, you're sunk. <laughs> really. Okay, English is amazingly consistent though. Why don't we add a K to critic to make criticism? Because it softens in the derivative. Why don't we add a K in toxicity? Because it actually softens. All right, let's talk about silent final E's for a minute. Most of us knew the rule, know the rule that cap becomes cape, pet, peat, rip, ripe, and rob, rope, right? This is the rule, the vowel says its name because of the E. This is a very important rule. It explains 50% of silent final E's. I'm actually not joking, it is a very important rule. It's 50%. But what are you going to be telling your students if this is the only reason you know? You are going to be saying half of the time that is an exception. That's a problem. And by the way, those little engineering boys of mine that entire year that they couldn't read, they misread have as have and give as guy. Were they wrong? They were not wrong because it was the only reason I told them. And in fact, do you know now? You actually do. Why is there a silent final E in these words? English words do not end in I, U, V, or J. Every time you hear a V at the end of the word, you need a every time. Wouldn't that have been easier to learn than memorizing all of these in isolation from one another? Why do you need a silent E in true blue value continue? Because English words do not end in U. If you have a U at the end, you need an E. English words do not end in V or U. By the way, I love this picture. Because look at this dad, he looks kind of unhappy and the boy is not real happy and they're drilling their adult sight words because this little boy is probably misreading have his have over and over again and the father's going, no, it's half. <laughs> uh, all he would need to do is say English words don't end in V and the boy would have a reason for that silent E. Why do we have a silent final E in choice, commerce, force, absence, and voice? Yeah, what would this say without it? Choik. Why do we have a silent final E in orange, change, large, and language? What would this say? Oring. D 
Do you see it? The C says, and the G says J because of the E. Now this is only four of the nine reasons for a silent E. And I can't share all of them with you because of time, so you'll have to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Now, you need to know, this might sound obvious now, but did you know you need to know why the E is needed to know if you can drop it? Sounds logical, right? How many of us were taught drop the E when adding ING? I do not know what was happening in this generation. This is universal across the country. <laughs> and I want to go to those textbook writers and those teachers and go, there are a lot of suffixes in English. What about A-B-L-E? How about L-Y? What about E-D? You only told me about I-N-G. <laughs> How many of you learned drop the E when adding a vowel suffix? Anybody? Notice it's not very many. This is actually very close, but you have to know why the E was needed before you know if you can drop it. So I'm going to show you a few examples of this. We drop the E in like to make liking. We drop the E in like to make likable. We drop the E in service to make servicing. Why can we not drop the E in serviceable? It would say cervicable. Is it clear? Is it really obvious once you know the rules? We drop the E in encourage to spell encouraging. Why can we not drop the E in courageous? It would say courageous. In fact, this is one of the most commonly misspelled words by adults, courageous. But once you know the rules, it becomes very clear why you need the E. So I have a confession to make. So I did my graduate training in curriculum and instruction in English as a second language, and I taught English in Russia, and I was an English teacher, you get the idea. But I had a hidden problem. It probably wasn't as hidden as I thought. I could not spell whatsoever. <laughs> I was a terrible speller, and I relied very heavily on spell check, but spell check and I did not have a very good relationship because I often would try to type in a word and spell check would not recognize it. And so I would be typing along, and I'm, I think I'm a pretty good writer, and I would have to give up the perfect word because spell check couldn't figure it out for me. Now, how many of you have ever had this experience even once? And I want you to take a moment. Actually, put your hands back up because you guys are highly literate. Do you notice this? And I was shocked when I discovered that this is as common as it is because I thought that this was just me. And I felt really stupid about it. Did you guys, do you ever feel that way when you get hit that point? So learning the spelling rules and learning the phonograms is vital to being able to use our tools. What do we always tell kids if they can't spell a word? Go look it up. How are you going to look it up in the dictionary if the intelligent dictionary can't even recognize it? The one that's trying to figure out what I did wrong. So we need these rules. Even when we're good spellers, these are what will help us use spell check accurately and be able to utilize our tools. So this is what's happened for me personally. I was a very bad speller and I used to rely heavily on spell check. I don't really use the look it up function anymore because as I learned these phonograms and rules to teach my students, it transformed how I spell. So now I rely on the underline function. Do you know what I'm talking about when you're typing and it underlines it? And I'm able to go, oops, I reversed those two letters. Or, oh, it must be the other spelling of the A sound because I know what all my options are and I don't have to look them up. These rules are not just important for those people who are struggling with reading. They are important for all of us. All right, how many of you learned the ending, T-I-O-N, Sean? I did. Does it create confusion for any of you? Once again, an incredible oversimplification of our language. There are really three spellings of the sound sh used in the middle of the word. They all come from Latin. They are T-I-C-I -I and S-I. By the way, S-I says two sounds. It says sh and zh. What's the difference between these two sounds? They're a voiced and unvoiced pair again. In fact, this S-I is the only way to spell zh in English. Think of words like division. Would be important to know that sound. I want you to notice, though, there's a tip that I can give you as to how to figure out which one is used. If you have express, it becomes expression with an SI. Why did I use an SI? Express ends in a S. Face becomes facial because face has a C in it. Space spacious, do you see this pattern? 
inspect, inspection, we use the T-I-O-N because it's a T there, locate, location. Now, this does not work for all words because some of the Latin roots are not um, English words. And, but it is actually consistent across the language. All of, it is, does that make sense? If you, if you know the Latin root, you'll be able to figure this out. But you can teach your students now, when they hear a shun or a sh facial, facial, they have to think of the root first to know how to spell it correctly. I want to take a moment. I don't know if any of you have a pen and pencil or a piece of paper, but if you do, please pull one out. I want to dictate a couple words to you. And what I want you to do is I want you to think about the words um, now using some of the rules and some of the sounds that we've been learning. And just try to experience it a little differently. Uh, the first few words are very simple. So our first word is going to be boy. And I don't want you to write it yet, but I want you to sound it out with me. B Oi. What kind of oi will you use? Why can't you use oi? English words don't end in i. Go ahead and write it. B, oi. And then you can help me write it. B, oi. And then you may underline the oi. I teach all my students to underline those multi-letter phonograms because it trains your eye to see them as a picture of that sound. Let's try the word paper. How many syllables in pay per? First syllable is pay. P a. Second syllable is per. Send it out with me. P er. Go ahead and write it. By the way, I teach uh, people to read in the same, the same way. I teach them to think of words, to have to break them into their sounds, write them. They have to analyze it this way. So they learn to read through spelling. Let's sound it out together. P a p er. Why did the A say its name in paper? because it's at the end of the syllable. And then we can underline the er, because it's working together to say er. Let's compare this to pepper. How many syllables in pep, per? First syllable is pep, sound it out, p, e, eh, p. Second syllable is per, p, er. Go ahead and write it. Let's sound it out together. P, e, eh, p, p, er. Now, notice there are two Ps here. When we have two Ps, it closes the syllable so the vowel is not at the end. What would it say if we only had one P? Peeper. That's often the reason for double consonants in English. It's to close that syllable so the vowel says its short sound. All right, this is my favorite word. Miscellaneous. Now, many of you are good spellers, so let's see. I want us to think about this all together before you write it. Let's sound it out. Miss. Sell, lay, ni, us. How many syllables? One more time. Miss, sell, lay, ni, us. Five syllables. Let's sound out each syllable. First syllable is miss. M, I, s. This is a s, z. Second syllable is sell. S. This is a k, s. E, l. Third syllable is lay. L, a. Fourth syllable is ni. N, e. Fifth syllable is us. Us, and if you need a hint, maybe I can give you one. It's the OU. I usually would show students. I don't make them guess when they're doing this process. Let's sound, go ahead and write it if you haven't. And then let's sound it out together. Miss. M, I, S, Sell. S, E, L. Lay. L, A. Ni. N, E. Us. Why did the C say S in this? Because it's followed by an E. Why did the A say A? It's at the end of the syllable. Why did the E say E? At the end of the syllable. And then we have the phonogram saying us. Now, when I used to look at these words, by the way, I learned to read very intuitively. And reading was never a problem for me. But when I looked at this, I didn't really get it. I just thought, M-I-S, that says miss. I don't know why the k is there, because I only was taught that C says k as in cat. And so then the middle of the word became miscellaneous to me. Do you know what I'm talking about? Because the letters didn't really make sense. And then I saw the U-S, and, and the rest of it I learned to spell M-I-S-C-E-L. <laughs> and I was trying to rotely memorize it. But now it's very obvious, isn't it, exactly why it's read and spelled the way it is. All right, English is a morphophonemic language. I talked about this briefly, but I want to show you a little bit more about this. So we have the word vacant and vacate. And what is the A saying? It's saying, what, what is the A saying in evacuate and vacuous? 
How about in vacation? Uh. So here the A is saying three sounds, but what does vacant mean? It means empty. To vacate a room means to leave it empty. To evacuate means to leave it empty. If something is vacuous, it's empty. And if you go on vacation, you leave your house empty. These are all related in meaning. And this is why they're all spelled in the same way. Does anyone know what tract means? It's, yeah, it means to pull. And we have a tractor. A tractor does what? It pulls. If we retract, we pull back. Con means with or together. So a contract is something where we pull together. I think that is a really beautiful picture of what it means to contract with someone. Or a contractor on a job site is someone who pulls everybody together. Extract, X means out as an exit. So if you extract something, you pull it out. D means down as in depress. If you detract, you pull down. What does struct mean? Do I have any ideas? What are some words that come from struct? Structure, construction, instruct, destruct. Here are all of the derivatives of struct. Notice destructive. D means to build down when you, so destructive means literally to build down. Instruct means to build in. Ob means against. So to obstruct means to build against. To restructure means to build again. Isn't that powerful? When you begin to see how the roots play in. Now, a few months ago, I went to the IDA convention and I did some professional development. And I I'm really into morphology right now. That's the thing I really want to learn more about. I know some about it, but I've, I'm just soaking it up. Does that make sense? It's a fascinating topic. And the instructor put up the root psi. And I thought, I have no idea what that one is. Do you, does anyone know? It comes from science. Science literally means knowledge. So omniscience, omni is all knowing. Con means with, so conscience is with knowledge. By the way, here are all of the words derived from the root psi. And then the instructor put up the word prescient or prescient. And I said, I have never seen that word. And that's so cool because I know exactly what it means. What does it mean? Before knowledge. How many of you knew this word before you just saw it? More of you than a typical audience, uh, once again. But now I'm going to tell you a personal story. Because I had thought I hadn't seen the word prescient before. And I read a lot. I, read, I can read a book in a day. I, I've read a lot of the classics. I consider myself highly literate. And I thought, wow, I didn't, I, don't know what, I didn't know what this means. Do you know what? I have read this word in the news, in the news, four times since November. And in fact, I, now I'm getting emails from people who listen to the presentation and go, I've seen it too. <laughs> but the lesson it taught me was this. I have learned a lot of my vocabulary from context. But this one, for some reason, I didn't learn it from context. I must have glossed over it every time after reading it hundreds, maybe thousands of times in my lifetime. I didn't pick it up. But can you see how powerful roots are? Because roots would have clued me to the meaning of it. These are the literacy statistics in the United States as of 2011 in fourth grade. 34% of students read below basic. Essentially, they can't read. 34% of students read below proficient. Notice only 32% are proficient or above. I call this the law of thirds because I have experienced this when I speak to public schools, but I also experience it in the homeschool community where I do a lot of speaking as well. And I've experienced it in my own family. About one third of students learn to read magically. They just pick it up. They're gifted at language. They're not the majority. About one third of students need additional help, but they'll, they'll get it, but maybe not all the way. They'll just continually struggle a bit through their lives, but they get it enough to go on. And about one third of students without significant intervention and explicit teaching are not learning to read. These are the eighth grade literacy statistics as of 2011. Notice the same 32% 
are still reading at grade level or above. And I consider myself very, unfor very fortunate. I grew up in a disadvantaged home. And one of the reasons that I am very, very passionate about literacy is because I understand that I was one of the 32%. I just got it. But I struggled in math until a teacher in seventh grade um, took me aside and tutored me. I was in the lowest math group. And he tutored me. And he brought me up to the algebra class in the honors algebra class in eighth grade. And it was, if it wasn't for him, I would have still been thinking, I'm stupid. There's something wrong with me, even though I could read. And so I identify with that feeling. I identify with the hopelessness it brings. And I also realized, as I've thought a lot about my life, that it's books. I escaped to books. I escaped a lot of uh, abusive situations and things by being able to go and read. And that's how I dealt with it. And do you know what books taught me? Books taught me that women can be powerful, that women can be heroes. And they taught me to dream a different life. And I look at that and I think, wow, I had no idea so many of the kids around me were struggling. And they didn't have access to those same dreams through books as I did. These are the literacy statistics for adults. Um, and what I want you to notice is 49% of adults read in the lowest two levels of literacy. And only 3% read in the highest levels of literacy. And this might be really shocking to you, because it was to me. But the way I got started doing this is um, I learned the phonograms and rules to help my own kids. And then I started giving a presentation called The Logic of English to other parents, and then to some teachers. And do you know what surprised me? The number of well-educated adults, adults with master's degrees and PhDs, who would come forward in tears telling me that they struggled with language. People who own businesses, people who are clearly really, really smart, and it's a place of a deep pain for them. In fact, I live in Rochester, Minnesota. If any of you are familiar with it, it's the land of the Mayo Clinic. We're type A-ville there, <laughs> highly, highly educated. And I would be sitting at a picnic, and they'd ask me, what, you, what am I doing? And I'd explain, well, I wrote this book, and I want to make a difference in reading in America. And they would, every person at this table, physicians, researchers, if they were not personally affected by literacy, their child was or their sibling was. It is only one person away from everyone I believe in this nation. But I have really, really good news. The research is astounding. They have now done functional MRIs as people are reading. And they have discovered that struggling readers read with the front right side of their brain. Strong readers read with the back left side of their brain. The back left side of their brain is thought to be um, auditory processing. It's a lot of the same areas you use to speak and to understand. And what's really incredible is that with about 80 hours of systematic instruction in how the language works, not only do these people learn to read and their test scores go up dramatically, their brains go from looking like that of a struggling reader to that of a strong reader. And as Dr. Reed Lyon has shared, who's one of the researchers who does this research, he's a neurologist, he said, you can do as educators, you can do as tutors, you can do as parents what brain surgeons cannot. You can rewire the brain. Isn't that powerful? That is so, so powerful. So I want to share with you the story of Allie Gower. Isn't she amazing? <laughs> She's a designer. And wait till I tell you more about her. She's a mixed media artist. And I have a good friend named Katie. Katie was on an airplane, and she happened to be sitting next to Allie. And in the conversation, in the course of this conversation, Allie described herself to Katie as stupid about five or six times. And what came out was that Allie struggles with reading. In fact, Allie went on to share and has shared um, with me that she struggled to even read a recipe that she would have to look at each word because she couldn't comprehend it as a whole. She could read words, but she couldn't get the meaning of it. She couldn't read and comprehend. In fact, in her blog, she said her brain experienced reading like this, the quick blah, 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 blah fox, or whatever it is, blah, 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 blah. So she'd get a word here and there, but she couldn't get the rest of it. And she said, she, this is what she's told me. I'm just astounded. I wrote Uncovering the Logic of English for tutors. I wrote it for teachers. I wrote it for parents. But Katie gave Allie 
a copy of Uncovering the Logic of English. And do you know what Allie proceeded to do? She proceeded to take the tables in there that share the sound of the phonograms and teach herself to read all by herself. And she taught herself the rules. And then she shared that she's read her first Nicholas Sparks novel and read and comprehended it. This woman is brilliant. And yet she was left with the message that there's something wrong with her because she struggled. And I think she struggled because she was taught in a way that didn't make sense to her. So as I said, I'm on a mission to change how reading's taught. And I can't do it alone. It's a really big country. <laughs> And I have little kids at home, okay, medium-sized kids at home, teenagers. <laughs> so I want to ask you, if this makes sense to you, share it. It's being videoed today. There'll be a link to it on the website. Link to it on your blogs. Share it with people. Send it to people. You know, join us on Facebook. We have a Logic of English Facebook page. Twitter, I don't know how to tweet. I just don't get it. But if you do, go for it. <laughs> Blog about it. Talk about it on message boards. Check us out. I'm putting, trying to put up more videos um, this next fall that are just going to be free to provide free education to the community. But join me in changing and sharing this information. And one last thought for you. Tell your neighbors. Tell your friends. Tell your family members. And this might sound totally geeky, but if you thought it was really cool that English words don't end in V, tell people. Because until this knowledge is as common as 1 plus 1 equals 2, we're not going to solve the literacy crisis. <laughs>